This is my suicide attempt share. I've never really went into detail in sharing my suicide attempt, and I feel that now is probably the right time to share about it. Uh, I finally am a lot more comfortable with it. And so I hope that this helps somebody out there because when it came to wanting to take my life and attempting to take my life, nobody saved my life except for frozen vodka. Literally frozen vodka saved my life. That was it. It wasn't anyone. It's also for the ones out there that maybe have lost a loved one to suicide thinking that it's their fault. I can tell you this, it's, it's not, it's, it's a series of events. And so hopefully somebody gets something out of this. Um, if you're new to my channel, hit the like and subscribe button. My name is Eric. I'm diagnosed with ADHD, PTSD, GAD, and MDD. Those are my diagnoses. I take medication. I see a therapist. I've self-harmed before. I'm a recovering cocaine and alcoholic addict. And I lost my wife and father to suicide. In September of 2018, I wanted to take my life. Uh, became hellbent on it. It was a series of events though. So 2018, July was one year of me being sober from alcohol and cocaine. Uh, I had already started a movement of urging people to reach out. I'd already started putting my number out every single day on Twitter actually at the time, urging anybody who's struggling to feel free to text me or call me that, you know, I'd be your friend and I'd sit in the dark with you until the light comes. And I still hold true to that. But in September, it was a series of events that led me to wanting to take my life here in my garage. Um, the rafters that you see right there, those two hooks is what I had my rope hung by. I was doing it over concrete in the garage with bleach and a scrub brush out in case there was blood or anything uh, from my uh, uh, attempt. Because I was, I was there. I didn't want to live anymore. I parted ways with my job. I was a sales manager at an RV dealership in August. And August has always been a hard month for me. My dad took his life on August 13th, uh, 2017. My wife took her life on August 27th, 2015. My birthday is August 17th. So August is like a very different month for me. It's a hard month. And that month I ended up getting betrayed by somebody who I invested a lot of time into at work. Um, things went down at work that I was uh, really, really shocked by. Um, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, we parted ways. I'd never had lost a job before without really having something lined up. Um, and I, this time was different. I was in a very big state of confusion of what I wanted to do. Uh, California is very expensive. I started to instantly stress about money. Uh, I started to instantly stress about how am I going to take care of my household? How am I going to keep a roof over my head? How am I going to, how am I going to, how am I going to, um, suicide is the leading cause of death in males 25 to 45. And I'm in that age group. So my job is taken away from me. My wife is, is reminding me that it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I had stopped taking my Adderall. I didn't even realize it. When I lost my job, I'm very routine and structure oriented. That's what keeps a lot of my sanity. And now not having a job, my structure and routine completely crumbled and I didn't know what to do. One of the things that I started doing though is I was missing my Adderall every single day. And if you're ADHD, you can't, it's very hard to control your thoughts without medication. And I didn't even realize that. And I'm still telling people, hey, reach out, reach out, reach out. And Next thing you know, my wife is telling me, hey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And I didn't believe her. I knew things were a little rocky at her job. She actually ended up later on um, getting fired and then rehired back um, from her job, which was pretty screwed up. But not, not knowing what my future held started to let the most dangerous emotion that I've ever felt creep in, which was hopelessness. I truly, for the first time in my life, felt hopelessness. I felt that there was no hope. I, I felt that nothing, no matter what, there was, there was no hope. It was never going to get better. It truly sunk in. And I didn't tell anybody that I was struggling. I didn't ever ask for help. I didn't, I didn't share what was going through my head. I, I said nothing. And I pretended that everything was okay. And being very confused of what do I want to do for a living? Like, I'm, I'm almost 40, like... What do I do? Do I, do I start over? Do I continue in the same field? I mean, I was, I've been in sales 19 years of my life. I mean, that's all I know. 
I uh, don't have a college degree. And all of these different things started seeping in. I missed my dad. My dad wasn't there to help me through this time to be like that backbone and rock. He always was. Uh, I never really reached out to my mom too much in that fashion. So I had lost my rock. I'm, I'm feeling completely hopeless. And each day it just grew and grew and grew more and more and more. Um, I stopped showering. I stopped changing my clothes, started to smell, stopped shaving. And each day that hopelessness sunk in even more uh, to the point of why am I even waking up? But yeah, I pretended to everybody that everything's okay. And yeah, I'm, I'm searching for a job. I don't know really what I want to do. I hadn't made a fucking call. I hadn't talked to anybody. I was just like, what's the point of this? It's, this is, it's all repeating. And you know, people told me that when I got sober, my life is going to get better. Well, it fucking hasn't gotten better, you fucking liars. I mean, that's what's going through my head. I mean, I'm a year sober, motherfuckers. And my life is crumbling apart. I mean, all these little pieces started to lodge themselves in my brain. And I started logically coming up with being able to justify taking my life. And how I ended up doing this is... This was the other part that I realized was extremely dangerous that led me down the road was one, the hopelessness, but now logically selling myself on why I need to do this. If I wasn't here, I wouldn't be a burden to my wife. I wouldn't be a burden to my mom. Nobody would have to uh, have any financial responsibilities with me. Um, you know, people would be taken care of and, and life would move on. Look at, I moved on after my dad died. I moved on after my wife died. Uh, that life will still go on. So it's not going to miss me when I'm gone. And I'm not going to drag everybody down with me because all I'm doing is dragging everybody down. I'm a financial burden. I'm an emotional burden. Um, they, nobody needs me here. If I'm not here, life is easier. There, there's one There's one removal of weight off, in, off of people's shoulders. One, one less person people have to check up on. I mean, this is what I'm selling myself on. At the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling to my wife. I'm, I'm lying to everybody that I'm doing great. And like, it's all right. I, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. And in my back of my head, I'm constantly thinking of, you know, what, what do I do? I don't want to be here anymore. I was thankful. Um, I came up almost with this idea versus some of the ideas that even later on here, I've come up with of ways to take my life. Luckily, I've caught myself a lot sooner. But I finally decided that I needed to do this that it was not going to get any better. The hopelessness had completely taken over. I found absolutely zero joy in doing anything at all. And even the Twitter video that day, if you look at the Twitter videos in the beginning of September, um, those videos were, you know, I'm smiling, telling people to reach out and inside. I'm fucking dying. I'm, I'm over it. I'm hopeless. I'm lost. And I'm lying to everybody. Even when people are asking me, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine, dude. Everything's great. I'm wearing the fakest smile in the world and it's awesome. Yeah, don't, don't worry about it. I'm just, I'm figuring things out a little bit right now. And inside, I'm like, how can I take my life? I didn't do any research. I didn't do any of that. I was just going to hang myself here in the garage. And I knew I had these two hooks. So I waited for my wife to leave and I did my Twitter message and all this and I sat outside, I smoked probably about 10 cigarettes, had a bunch of coffee and said, nope, today's the day. Today's the day that I need to do this. So I got out a step stool, I got out rope, I got out a paper and I ended up writing my suicide letters. I wrote a letter to my wife. I wrote a letter to my brother. I wrote a letter to my mom. And I just wrote a letter in general. I burned those letters, didn't save them. I didn't, I didn't, I don't need to save those. And I knew I had to wait for my wife to come home. She would come home for lunch. I needed to wait for her to do that. And I hugged her that day and I kissed her and I told her I loved her. And those would have been her, her last words from me. And this whole time, I'm not taking my meds, nothing, but it's not registering in my brain. I'm, I'm, I got to a point that this was just so logical to me that it made sense. And it made complete sense. You couldn't have talked me out of it. I literally would have been needed to be locked up because nothing was going to talk any sense into me. I didn't want to be a burden anymore. 
So she left. And I did the whole lying thing of I'm looking for a job and all this. And I'm like, hey, today's the day. Like, I'm going to free everybody from me. They're not going to have to worry about me anymore. And I'm not going to be a burden on them anymore. And it'll be hard for, for a little while, but it's going to be okay. My roommate at the time, he was at work, so nobody was home. And I took down, we had a, it's still up there, the, the, the pink and gray uh, yoga. I took that down. I ended up tying a rope up there. It wasn't like a noose or anything like that. It was nothing. It was enough that it would I could twist it. I mean, I, I even weight tested it <laughs> to make sure that it wouldn't fall when, when my full weight got on it. And I needed to make sure that there was no way that I could get out of it. So she left and I didn't even take a shower or anything. I, I didn't shave or anything, but I changed my clothes. I came out to the garage, I hung the rope, I got the step stool that I'd already found and pulled out. I put that there, I grabbed bleach and I grabbed a scrub brush and I put that in the garage because when you hang yourself, it's not uncommon for people to yank at their, their neck to try and get the rope. And I was like, man, I'm probably gonna do that. And if I do, there's gonna be blood. I want, I want them to be able to clean up the mess easy. So I had bleach and I had a scrub brush out here. We still have the scrub brush. It's a white handle and blue scrubbies. And I knew inside the fridge we had vodka. It was Grey Goose Vodka, fifth. And, you know, AA and, and getting sober failed me. I mean, I was always, and it's still funny because it is the case even today. I was still financially and career-wise more successful at providing being a complete addict than I have been not being an addict. And that's the reality of it. I'm not bashing my sobriety. I wouldn't trade it for anything because there are way more benefits to life than, than that. But at that time, I was so convinced that sobriety had also failed me because going to AA, hearing these people that their life got better, their life got better. My, my life hadn't gotten fucking any better. That, that fifth was in there. I knew it was tucked into the back. So my plan was, because I am so structured and routine, was I put my rope up, I tested it, made sure it held, got my bleach, got my brush, had my step stool, because I had to find the step stool and put it out. So now the garage is all set up. This is where I'm doing it at. Now, went outside, I smoked a couple more cigarettes, and I go, okay, my, my route now is, I am going to go in, I'm gonna slam the fifth of vodka, my letters were already laid out on the counter. Slam the fifth of vodka, letters are out, I'm gonna go grab some clothes that I wanna be buried in or cremated in, that's what I wanted to be done. Actually, it was a request of my letters to be cremated. Wanted to be cremated. I want to be cremated in these clothes. And I will have those in a bag, put these by the, by the letters. By that time, the vodka that I slammed should be into my system, so I had that additional liquid courage to make sure I pushed over the edge. I'm fucking ready to do this because I hate my life. I'm hopeless. Like, it was hopeless. Hopeless. It's the scariest emotion to me. It's hopeless. Because when that hopelessness sinks in, that logical side of your brain, like, all the emotion is gone. You're not crying. There's none of that. You have logically planned this out and have convinced yourself how much it's going to help everyone. So you almost, you feel good. There's this sense of enlightenment, this sense of joy almost that this pain's going to stop for you. And everybody's life's going to be better. I, I will say doing this and going through it, it wasn't something that I was sad about. It was more like relieving than anything it was the biggest emotion that I felt. I felt very relieved that I was going to lift this weight off of everybody. So we can do this is what I'm telling myself. And we got this. I'm not telling anybody at all that I'm struggling. I mean, I'm, I'm now feeling like, hey, all right. Enjoyed my last cigarette, came inside and go, okay, I'm going to drink this, get the clothes, boom, going to, by the time that hits, the vodka is going to be into my system. I haven't drank in over a year, so it's going to hit me pretty hard. I'm going to step up on this ladder. I'm going to hang myself. Came inside, went, grabbed out the vodka, pulled out the vodka, and the vodka is fucking frozen. My wife had taken the vodka, dumped it out and put water in it and put it back in the freezer. 
And all that happiness and joy and burden lifting that I had totally left my body and it flipped to anger. Like, why the fuck did you do this? You didn't trust me or think I could do this. And then I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck are you doing? I mean, I'm holding a frozen bottle of water vodka in my hand, looking at my suicide letters, looking at what I'm wearing, fucking going, my God, I'm going to fucking hang myself in a minute. I'm like, something's not right. Something's not right. This isn't right. This isn't right. And I just remember repeating, this isn't right. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. This isn't right. This isn't right. And that literally that frozen vodka like shifted my thought process. If I would have kept that joyous, I'm relieving everybody's burden mentality, I would have went through with it. Instead, it flipped to anger, flipped to something's not right, started repeating it. And I call my mom, I remember. I call my mom. I'm like, something's not right. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I do. I didn't even really go into a whole lot of detail with her because that's when it got blurry. Like my head just went from so structured and planned out of relieving everybody and helping everybody to my brain went into, this isn't right, angry, how could you not trust me, yet I'm going to kill myself. Like, like the, the logical, you're removing everything, like flipped almost to like, I'm mad now at people, like you sons of bitches. Like I was really happy and this was all going to be over. You sons of bitches took this from me. And I'm like, but this isn't right. Why am I upset that I'm kidding? Like this isn't right. I call my wife. I'm like, I need help. This, I'm, I'm, yeah. She's like, dude, dude, what's going on? What's happening? And I tell her. And I'm on the phone with her. I'm taking down the fucking rope. I'm so angry. I'm taking down the fucking rope and putting the yoga thing back up. I'm like, I'm an idiot. Why am I going to even have this here? Like for display purposes only? I was that mad. But I was happy at the same time of like looking back at it. I'm, I'm thankful as all hell I didn't do it. And I grabbed those letters. I held on to those letters for a little while. I didn't tell anybody about them. I ended up burning them. And like, here I am, joyous, hopeless. It was all going to be removed, I thought. And then I just I started realizing how many people cared about me. And then how much I cared about my dad. And how much I cared about my wife. When they, when they took their lives, it was really hard. And I still miss them a lot. And it's okay to miss them. But it also opened up my eyes that there's nothing I could have did to save them because it's a series of events. That hindsight's 2020. And the pain that they had isn't my right to hold on to because the pain that I had when I wanted to pass and take my life was nobody's right to hold on to. That wasn't their pain, it was my pain. And I had to work through it and I did. And it was the strongest thing I ever did is to then pick up these pieces and go, what happened and how did I get here? To realizing that hopelessness was this emotion that was deadly to me. To, man, I have forgotten my medication. I didn't realize how deep the depression was getting that. I wasn't paying attention that I'm not changing my clothes, that I'm not working out. Like I had stopped everything I was doing that was bringing me any joy. Because I thought I couldn't find joy in it anymore, which was bullshit. Because I found joy in it again. But at that time, it was a different story. I had convinced myself logically. And I mean, even to this day, uh, Philip, who is CG kid, he was in the car one time. And like I was telling him how I felt. And he's like, dude, you're making this sound extremely logical. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's what I literally did. Is I made this into a logical, non-emotional just the hopelessness had, had overran every emotion feeling. But when I asked for help and realized how many people wanted me here still, and I didn't understand why, because I was supposed to be a burden to these people, and I'm not all of a sudden, they're asking me, how can I help? That I didn't know even how to tell them that I needed help or, or how to get help from them. But it then all of a sudden kind of remotivated me. I said, no. You know what? I can do this. This this isn't where it ends at. This isn't how it happens. This isn't how this story's fucking ending. And I took control over it again. Because I made that choice. I made that choice. I made that choice that I was going to give it everything I have. And I did. And I ended up finding a job. And that... 
We ended up piecing things back together. But also the worst thing too is not reaching out for any help. I mean, I, if it wasn't for that bottle, I wouldn't be here. If that bottle wouldn't have been replaced, I wouldn't be here. But it was. And I think that everything does happen to an extent for a reason. And it made me realize that next time that I'm struggling, I need to say, hey, I'm struggling. And just tell them I'm struggling. I don't even have to go into it. What, what, what's going on? I'm just struggling. I'm hurting. I have to have healthy boundaries against myself, too. And so the healthy boundary that I even have against myself is when I feel hopelessness start to creep in is when I ask for help. Because I owe it to myself. I owe it to everybody to give them the opportunity. It's not my right to hold on to my, my dad's death or my wife's death, but it is my right and my, my chance to change that and give the people in my life the opportunity. So when hopelessness sets in, that is my red flag that I need to ask for help. And I did. And in January of this, this year, I had to start reaching out a little bit and ask for help as soon as I noticed my brain going logical. But you have to have those boundaries against yourself and be aware of them. And the biggest thing is being honest to yourself and, and being honest with yourself. And it's hard to be honest with yourself. It truly is. It's a scary thing to be honest with yourself because you find out shit that you don't want to talk about or know about or think about because it's sitting back there and we're just tucking it away. We're just tucking it away. But it's our responsibility. It's all tripping me out. I'm in my garage even right now and the fucking door's like shaking. <laughs> Give me fucking goosebumps. But I'm here to share that story. And I hope that it helps somebody out there that's struggling, that's feeling that way. And I hope it helps somebody out there who tells everybody that they're suicidal, but you're just in pain. You know, I, I think that there is a huge difference between attention seeking and connection seeking. I don't think anyone's ever seeking attention. I think we're seeking a connection. But to that person that when they say, you know, suffering silently, struggling silently, I truly, I was, and nobody knew. And I did everything I could protect it so that nobody knew. Which I realized was the same with my dad and with my wife. I think that was one of the biggest grief things that helped me come to terms a lot with their suicides was the fact that I attempted suicide. So I realized what they had went through and what they had experienced that that wasn't my right to hold on to. They were in pain. And they did it out of wanting to prevent the pain that they felt they caused everybody, which wasn't the case, but in your head, you don't know any better. So if you are struggling out there and you are thinking about killing yourself and you're not telling anybody and you're wearing that fake smile, give everyone in your life the opportunity to prove you wrong and you'll be surprised what will happen because People want you here. You are loved. But that was my suicide attempt. And I call it an attempt because it wasn't like I, you know, hung myself in the rope broke or anything, but frozen gray goose vodka prevented it. And if you ever meet me in person, you'll know how logical I can be and how calculated I am that Yep, if that wasn't frozen, I would have went right through the whole little cycle. If you haven't hit the like and subscribe button, hit the like and subscribe button. Comment down below. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your stories. I'd love to hear your experiences. I've never really shared that before in detail with anyone. In the, uh, in the description, I have links to all my different social medias. I have links to the mental health discord communities, peer to peer support. I have link down below to better help try online therapy. It's trial and error to find out what happens. I even have links to things on Amazon, like fidget cubes, fidget spinners, things that I use that help me. I even have a link down below to renewal recovery, which is a uh, recovery uh, organization that actually has an inpatient mental health therapy center that you can get the help that you need. Reach out for help. You owe it to yourself. 
You really, truly do. You're a BAMF. You're a badass motherfucker. You made it through 100% of your worst days to make it through to you today. And together, together we got this. Hit that like and subscribe button. And I'll sit with you in the dark until the light comes.